Wow. <laughs> um, thanks for the uh, welcome, Mark. It never sounded so good. Um, I, I, it's great to be here. I do have um, four daughters and uh, one wife, and, uh, which, which makes me kind of the world's expert on uh, nonverbal communication. I'm really good at that. I'm, I've worked out some of the kind of Morse code of the other sex, and, and um, I'm brilliant at makeup. I can do makeup. You know, Naked Palette 3, uh, Rebel Mac, Rebel Lipstick, you know, Bare Scent, Bare Minerals, all that stuff. I do all that stuff. And um, I, I'm a world expert on crappy American TV shows. You know, How I Met Your Big Bang Mother, Kardashian, Drivel stuff. I know, I know, I know all about that stuff. And, uh, and, and my daughters are really rude to me, which is why I like to travel. So my... <laughs> My, uh, I've got a 21-year-old, uh, 19, 17, 15. 15-year-old 15 the other day came up to me. She loves to grab my cheeks. She goes, oh, oh, oh daddy. She said, daddy, you have no friends. So I, um, I reeled off the many, many people who are my friends. And she said, daddy, you pay all those people. <laughs> They all work for you. <laughs> so I said, yeah, but they're my friends. But I'm, I'm really pleased to say that Mark and Karen are our friends. And, uh, and it's, it's great to be here. And I want to teach from a passage of scripture that I wouldn't usually teach on when I travel. You know, preachers have traveling stuff. You know, the stuff that they know, they don't have to. You think the people who come here to preach are amazing preachers. They're not. They just have like three really good sermons they've memorized. And you think, God, they do that without notes. This is not one of them. So I was, I was asking God, what, what do you want? And I, and I sensed that um, Jonah chapter 3 and 4, which is pretty random, but, uh, and, and it's going to be a little bit embarrassing at times for you and for me, uh, but uh, let's, let's go there. Jonah chapter 3 and 4. And it's a bit weird because we're going to hit the story of Jonah at the part of the story of Jonah that we don't know so well. Jonah chapter 3 and Jonah chapter 4. It's a crazy, crazy story, Jonah. I mean, the, the, uh, theologians, historians argue whether, whether it really happened or didn't happen, whether it was an allegory or not an allegory, whether it's true. What, what, what was it? So you've got this, this prophet of God. God speaks. And, and prophets are supposed to be the ones that listen when God speaks. But this prophet doesn't, well, he listens and then decides to do exactly the opposite, runs away, falls into the, was thrown into the sea, and gets eaten by a big fish, swallowed, and the fish spits Jonah out exactly in the place where God had originally told him to go. So it's, it's one of these kind of really weird uh, stories that kind of makes no sense, and then it makes loads of sense. Because all of us run from God, don't we? All of us. Or for, for some reason in our life, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we run away from God. Maybe it was church, maybe someone did something they shouldn't have done, maybe, maybe, maybe we just, just knew who God was and knew what he would ask of us, so we just said we run from God. And, and the thing is, when you run from God, you don't just run from the concept of God, you run away from the wisdom of God. <laughs> And the purposes of God and the love of God, because he's the source of all those things. It's like you put God in the rearview mirror and you drive away from him. So no wonder you'd end up doing stupid because wisdom is behind you. It's no wonder you end up looking for love in all the wrong places because love is behind you. It's no wonder you say, I can't find purpose in life because purpose is behind you. So it's a story that says we all run from God. And when we run from God, our life begins to unravel. Maybe for you, it's not the belly of a fish, but it feels like it. It feels like it. This is the account of what God does when we run and who God is. And we get all that because we probably, many of us, hung around in church long enough to be biblically dangerous. And we've got all that kind of stuff. We've got Jonah, we've got the fish, we've got the spewing on the sea, and we've got all that kind of stuff. But, but here in Jonah chapter 3, the story takes a strange twist and I have to give you a warning because for, for this story for some of us who are Christians is quite hard yards this is not going to this is going to be quite hard we're going to show, put, put up a mirror in front of us and go ooh that looks so good and, and, and if, you, if you come here for the first time this is your first Sunday here it might expose some stuff about Christians that you might not like very much and it might even expose something about the preacher and, and, and his heart that you're well, I don't ever have to come back again, so it's okay. 
So here we go, Jonah chapter 3 and 4. And we're going to open up, if you've got your Bible open, open up to Jonah chapter 3 and 4. If you've got your Bible on a phone and you play Angry Birds, you will go to hell. Uh, seriously, if you play Candy Crush, you are in hell already. Uh, Jonah chapter 3 and, and 4. Let's read from Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And I think that's exactly how he said it. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live which just tells us that he's a teenager. (laughs) But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a good and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the good. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the good so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it will be better for me to die than live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the good? It is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this good though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals, which is a little bit random. <laughs> but we'll, we'll ignore that. <laughs> let's, let's just pray and ask God to, uh, to reveal to us his truth. God, we have this audacious belief that this word is your word to us and that it's living and active and that you you not only spoke it, you speak it. And so come Holy Spirit and speak your truth to our lives. And we for our part will be those who hear and do your word. Amen. So keep your Bibles open. Jonah chapter 3. And we're going to go through this because you won't believe some of the stuff unless we actually go through it. Okay? So here we go. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah for the second time and God said, go to Nineveh. First, first thought, God is the God of the second chance. I mean, isn't that amazing? God, J- Jonah, the prophet, the one who's supposed to know, the one who's supposed to be the hero of this story is totally the anti-hero of the story. This story is totally ironic. I think it's, a, it's, it's one of these kind of ironic stories in the Bible. We've got idol worshippers and pagans who end up worshipping God. We've got vines and worms and sun and wind who end up being obedient to God. But the prophet of God, who's supposed to be worshipful and obedient, ends up running and drowning and whinging and getting angry. I mean, Jonah is pathetic. In every way, Jonah is pathetic. But God gives him a second chance to serve him. Isn't that incredible? Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that that he applies the same grace to my life and to your life? It is never too late to be who you might have been. It's never too late. It's never too late to say, God, I've been an idiot. God, I've run away from you. God, 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 I messed up. God, I morally, economically, I messed up. But but I, I, I repent. God is always wanting to work a way to restore and redeem and win back and show grace for you and me and for this city. Second thought, second thought, God loves people. God loves the city so much that he's willing to to intervene in every way possible to get Jonah to the place where people might hear the word of God. God loves this, 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 this is for that. 
We don't exist for this. You know how I did we there. I'm now a new member of staff of this church. We, we do not exist for this. We exist for the city, for the town, for everyone who doesn't yet know Jesus. That's what we exist for, because God loves the city. First two thoughts. Now, now, the Ninevites, they were savage warriors. This was like the evil empire. They didn't take prisoners. Let's, let's get real. This is like ISIS. This is, go to ISIS. Go to, go to where you're likely to die. Jonah, go and warn them. So he hears the word of the God and he goes into Nineveh, which was a sizable city, about 120,000 people. Apparently it's not that dissimilar in size, Cheltenham. First time in Cheltenham, it's lovely, isn't it? That's not in the scripture. (laughs) And Jonah wandered around, get this, saying, the end is near, thus saith the Lord. Maybe he had a sandwich board on. Turn or burn, fly or fry. You know, this was like the worst sermon ever. This is like the worst sermon ever. I mean, if 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 Mark preached it, I mean, just check. This is eight words. That's his sermon. That's it. I've preached some pretty bad sermons, but this is worse. Mark's preached some pretty. I'm I'm sure Mark's never preached any bad sermons, (laughs) but. But, you know, he's preached some bad sermons, but this is way worse. Eight words. Imagine if you were just checking out this church. Mark stands up and says, repent, for in 40 days you will be destroyed. And he sits down and says, let's do some ministry. Let's get the band up. Come on. Let's let's just do some ministry. Let's pray for everything. You know, you wouldn't be coming back, would you? You wouldn't come back to that kind of thing. And if you would come back, you're not welcome. Well, you probably aren't welcome. But, you know, that's not what the kind of church you... You want to be part of. But, but get this, look, verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. Isn't that incredible? How does that happen? A stranger walks around. A weird one at that. He's been in the belly of a fish. Stinks. 120, he doesn't say he stinks, but you can imagine he stinks. 120,000 people say, do you know what? He's right. Great sermon. He's right. Let's turn to the Lord. And everyone repents and puts on sackcloth and ashes and the king gets down in the dust. And look at verse 7 and 8, royal decree, sackcloth and ashes and the animals, (laughs) which is funny. It's ironic. Verse 9, who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is incredible. This is impossible stuff. This This is weirder than the fish thing. This is just ridiculous stuff. Unbelievable. Let me bend your mind just a little bit more. What if this is just what it looks like when God's people really partner with God? What if, what if that's what's supposed to happen? What if this is what's supposed to happen and, and our experience is abnormal? But what if this is what God really wants to do? Not just, not just in your interior life, but in the city in which you live. What if, we, what if this is what it looks like when we go all in? When we really get obedient to God, when we really listen to his voice, when we really cooperate with God's grace, what's supposed to happen is miracles are supposed to happen. Heaven is supposed to touch earth when people get courageous, obedient, and bold, full, which I know isn't a word, but you get what I mean. And God changes his mind. Don't miss this. This is huge. God changes his mind? Really? Yeah, yeah, it's rare. It's a rare occurrence in the scriptures, but it does happen a few times. Can you change God's mind? I guess many of us would think no, but here, here, yes. There is a, there is a state, a perfect storm, wherein the mind of God can be changed. And you find it right here. It's when the mercy of God, the furious grace of God, collides slap bang with something called genuine repentance. It's when the furious grace and compassion and mercy of God collides with genuine repentance. God changes his mind. And I think Jonah is in shock. Let's just pause for a moment. This is really important to get. This is what's supposed to happen. You see, and and, and it, it, it makes sense because God is incredibly good. 
His DNA is love and grace and mercy. And God has hardwired the people that he's created with a God-responder mechanism in their hearts and lives. And so God is always wanting, with his mercy and his grace, to invade the hearts and minds of those that he's created with this God hole, this God responder mechanism. And, and, and the way he's wired it is to use the people that have already responded to his grace to reach the people who haven't yet responded to his grace. And that sounded complicated. But basically what I mean is this. When God gets hold of your heart and nudges your heart and says, why don't you go and speak to that person? Why don't you go and sit with that person? Why don't you go and knock on the door of your neighbor? Why don't you just pray for that person? Why don't you just take a bold full step and go, you know, come on in. Why don't we get out of the building of this church? And you go, no, 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 no. They wouldn't want to hear. No, they're very likely to be a bit aggressive. No, it's, it's late at night. Or, you know, God has already set it up. In such a way that you're very likely to succeed because his grace and mercy compels him to be trying to reach people. And he's hardwired them to respond. This is what's supposed to happen. This is just normal Christianity. And and I guess if the story ended there, it would be great, wouldn't it? And we go, wow, what a great story. Do you know God's the God of the second chance? He loves the city. Jonah can preach the most ridiculous sermon in the world. People respond because God's a God of grace and God's hardwired people's hearts. And that's what's supposed to happen in Cheltenham and everywhere else. And it would just be amazing. And we just do ministry now and let's close in prayer. But what happens next is so strange and so weird. In fact, if you were to make it up, no one would believe a word you said. And, and actually, it's so penetratingly convicting that it's wonderful and terrible in equal measure. It's a bit embarrassing as well. So let's just read this together. Verse 10. When God saw, he relented. And God said, hey, the end is not so near because I'm a God of grace and mercy. And you would think that would be a win-win for Jonah, wouldn't you? Prophet of God. But read this. Jonah was deeply displeased. And he was angry, chapter 4, verse 1. And suddenly we see something about Jonah, and we understand why he didn't want to go in the first place. He he prayed to the Lord, and he said, I told you this was going to happen. That's my paraphrase. That's why I went to Tarshish. Hi, this is Jonah. Data roaming turned off. Out of the office for a while, forever. You know, that's why, that's why I went incommunicado. That's why I went to the farthest reaches of the world because I, I told you this was going to happen. And we begin to realize that Jonah didn't run from God because he was afraid of the Ninevites. He ran from God because he was afraid of what God would do on behalf of the Ninevites. And he hated these people. These were like scum. They're kind of Manchester United fans, that kind of thing. <laughs> these were, these were I, sit, these are the, I, I knew it, I knew it. And we think, man, has he got a problem. And then he compounds it. He compounds it by helping us understand that he's got incredible insight into the character of God. His theology is good. Jonah says, I know that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow of anger, abounding in love, a God who relents. I knew it. I knew if I came here and said this thing, they would repent and you'd do this and now I'm angry, take my life, it's better for me to die. What, what do we find? We find this. He knows God, but he is unpracticed in God's ways. He knows that God is a God of grace, but he's not had his heart enlarged by the grace of God. So he has no grace imagination. He doesn't see with the eyes of grace. And everything is messed up for him. It's all theory, it's not experience. Hmm. And so Jonah goes to the eastern side of the city and sits down. I think he's saying, come on God, let's see what you got. See what you got. And God produces a vine or a good and Jonah was very happy about the vine. And verse 7, the next day God provided a worm, and it ate the vine. And then verse 8, the Lord provided a Sirocco wind, scorching temperatures, and, and he's angry. 
And the word anger is used six times in this short passage. It's, anger is a really significant diagnostic tool. It's a very powerful emotion. Why is he so angry? I, I, I don't know. Let me, let me try this. Firstly, he's angry because God is doing something so far outside of Jonah's religious parameters that Jonah can't handle it. You ever experienced that? God doing something that, that you have decided according to your understanding of God and according to your theology or according to your experiences outside of what God would do and therefore you rule out that it could possibly be God. I don't know, maybe it's a healing, maybe it's a prophetic insight, maybe it's gold teeth or something or, or people coming to faith in, in, in ways that you didn't expect them to come to faith or God using people that he shouldn't use. I, I, I don't know, I don't know what your thing is. Israel is so proud of its race and its ethnicity. They're the, they're the chosen people. And God is now starting to save oppressors and Gentiles and pagans. And now all the boundaries are blurred. Guys, it is so easy to have a religious spirit. In which it's okay for you to be saved by grace. But you're not the carriers of grace. And you get to decide who's in and who's out. And you want church the way you want church. And then God goes and messes up your church. And exposes your heart. And and I tell you, you start to use phrases like my church, my relationship with God. And you start to own them and hold them. And it gets really ugly when that happens. Because it's not your church and it's not your relationship with God. His relationship with you. And it starts off being really inclusive for you, and then it becomes very exclusive. And you begin to provide a framework of who's in and who's out and what God really loves. And and you won't allow your heart to be enlarged by grace anymore. And so Jonah is sitting under a vine. And I think he's angry because his identity is also at stake. He is really messed up. His, his whole identity is in the fact that he's a prophet of God. And he had to go to Nineveh and, and now he's run and that's a bit messed up. And he's supposed to preach destruction and God has shown mercy. So his prophecy isn't even good. <laughs> and and, then, and then now he's going to have to go back to the northern kingdom and explain to the king that the arch enemy has all repented and it's all good and everyone's together. And, and now he's not even a good prophet. He's not even a popular prophet. And who in the world is he? In the words of my 15-year-old daughter, who even are you? <laughs> who even is now what she says who even give me the vine rather than the city give me the vine rather than the city give me the vine rather than the city Jonah I think we find him hard but you know what I've discovered this is my heart as well give me the vine rather than the city I'd rather have the comfort of the known than the vagaries of your grace. I'd rather have my limited role and identity than risk the largeness of the adventure of grace that you're propelling me into. And here's the thing that's really interesting. Even church can become a vine. It's my church. I just want the protection of this. I want, I want what I want. I love the worship. I like the teaching and I want the thing. And I don't want it messed up. And I don't want the people in that I don't want in. And I don't want to be having to go out because that's scary out there. And I'd rather have the vine than the city. And you miss out on the grace of God and the adventure of faith. And Jonah is angry. And, and what happens next is absolutely brilliant, he says. So they continue to listen. God God wants to put Jonah in touch with the root of his anger and the reality of God's plan for his life. And God wants to drag Jonah into the largeness of his grace, which is, I think, what he wants to do for some of us. And it's so important for Jonah that God will use anything, wind, storm, fish, vine, worm, heat. Verse 9, Jonah, do you have the right to be angry about the vine? I do. I am angry enough to die. I have been through that phrase, phase with kids. It's ridiculous, hilarious. Jonah, you have been all concerned about the vine, although you didn't plant it or tend it or make it grow. You got all attached to it and all angry about it, but it's a temporary thing. It's a vine. 
But Nineveh, Cheltenham, has 120,000 people who can't tell their left hand from their right hand. Which basically just means they're like kids. They don't, they don't know yet. Maybe that's part of the reason why God relented, because they don't really know. And they have many cattle. <laughs> Which they made it, I don't know, and they've been chanting them. It means there aren't many vegans around. <laughs> and you are more concerned about your own comfort for a temporary time than these people and their eternal destiny. And I'm going to give you comfort for a while because I love you and I want to give grace into your life. I love, I love to give you comfort. It's not a bad thing to have comfort. I want you to have good things. But if comfort is the ultimate end, not only is it poor and disappointing, you will miss out on this beautiful thing called grace. You will miss out of being the center of this thing called grace, being a recipient of God's undeserved favor in your life and being a dealer in grace. And God wants to drag you into the largeness of his grace and open your imagination for grace and open your heart for people who need to experience the grace of God. Look how the book ends. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Johnny, you're concerned about all the wrong things. I mean, they're not unimportant things, but you're concerned about all the wrong things. You're concerned that they get what they deserve, and you get what you deserve. Do you know what I'm concerned about, God says? I'm concerned that nobody gets what they really deserve. I'm concerned for grace. And this is where it gets really personal. Because for me, I know that I am concerned about people. And ultimately, I think in my best moments, I'm really concerned about people coming to know Jesus and people experiencing the love of God and the grace of God. But in the details of my life and in the moments of my life, there is a little Jonah in me. There's a little Jonah in me. And I can be far more concerned about how I'm going to make the financial thing work out or or, or, or how I'm going to do this or who's looking after me than about the person who needs to experience the grace and love of God. Jonah is in the middle of salvation and all he can see is the vine. And so are we. God's salvation is available even tonight. God's restoration available. God's healing available. We're going to pray in just a minute. God's salvation is available. His restoration is available. His healing is available for everyone. Sometimes all we can see is the vine. All we can think about are the things that concern our small lives. All we can think about are the people back home or the salary or the singleness or the sickness or the superficial stuff. All that stuff that is not unimportant but but binds us and blinds us from the salvation and we miss the largeness of God's grace. He's doing something bigger than saving for a conservatory. (laughs) Yes. He's doing something bigger. He's doing something so much bigger than that. It's not that having a conservatory, that was random. It's not that, it's not that having a conservatory is wrong in any way. If you want a conservatory, buy a big conservatory. But he's doing something bigger than that. He's opening your heart to the largeness of his grace. He's calling you to cooperate with him in the giving of his grace. He's calling for a people who will be dealers in grace. Saying, this is for that. Come on. And God says, Carl, Jonah, should I not be concerned? And he ends with a question which we're supposed to answer. It's a comparison question. Compare your vine with the city, Jonah. Compare your vine with the city. Things become vines for us. And we miss out on grace. Even spiritual things can become vines for us. And we miss out on grace. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that should be theirs the key verse of the whole of Jonah and the wonderful thing that all is this that all of that stuff which can sound incredibly condemnatory is said in the context of a God of the second chance all of that stuff the God of grace and mercy who says Jonah you ran and you lied and you got angry, and you hated it, and and you're a really bad prophet. But let's go again, shall we? Let's do it again. I am so grateful for grace. 
I'm so grateful for forgiveness and mercy. I'm so grateful that God didn't give up on me and doesn't give up on me. I'm so grateful for my father. Do you know the 1924 Olympic Games was famous for Eric Little? And uh, you'll, those of you who are old enough like me would remember the film Chariots of Fire, which incidentally I told my kids was one of the greatest films of all time, made them sit down and watch it and then realized how old it was and how slow. <laughs> Just like nothing happened. No one kills anybody. Nothing happens. No one snogs anybody. And you know, nothing happens. I'm going, something happened. I'm trying to get my kids. Into it. So it, that's got nothing to do with what I'm about to say. 1924 Olympic Games. Eric Little refused to run on the Sabbath. Um, because that was the principle that he held on to. He wanted to worship God with his life and, and was invited to run the 400 meters and won the gold medal, as you do. Uh, it's, it's famous for Eric Little. It's not famous for a guy called Bill Havens. Bill Havens was America's favorite for the canoeing gold medal because he was the world record holder. And uh, he was going to be on the team to go to Paris in France, 1924, and, and canoe or whatever you, you know, canoe. And he was, he was going to win the gold medal, but he found out just before he was due to leave to go to France on a boat and then go to training camp and then do the Olympics that his wife was pregnant with their first child. And he had a principal decision to make, and the principal decision was, do you go win your gold medal or do you stay to see the birth of your firstborn? Because you couldn't do both. And he stayed, and he never won a gold medal. In fact, to compound it, his brother won the gold medal. made a principal decision. In 1952, in the Olympic Games, in Helsinki in Finland, America's favorite for the canoeing gold medal, won the canoeing gold medal. And he wrote a letter to Bill Havens, because he knew about him. And he said, dear dad, I'm bringing home your gold. I'm bringing home your gold medal. Thank you for being there at my birth. You know, sometimes we think that we're going to give up an awful lot, don't we? To let go of our vine and move into the largeness of God's grace. But God is always the God of the second chance. God is always the God who provides abundantly more than we ask or imagine. God is a God of healing and restoration and salvation and grace and mercy and love. And he's got a plan for your life that's way bigger than the comfort of the vine. Would you open your heart to grace? Would you open your heart to grace? Let's pray.